Okay, so this talk is called OSH Obstetrics, and this is planned for the developing EM conference in Fiji coming up. Got a 30 minute talk. Um, we're going to cover six topics, about five minutes each. Now, the goal of them isn't to do an in depth review of the content, but just to give you a reasonable understanding and the ability to cope if this happens to you at work tomorrow. We're going to talk about shoulder dystocia, vaginal breech birth, placental problems postpartum hemorrhage, preeclampsia, and resuscitative hysterotomy. We'll get started on shoulder dystocia. Now, shoulder dystocia is bony entrapment of the anterior shoulder behind the pubic symphysis. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute. It's diagnosed when the baby's head delivers, but the shoulders fail to deliver. Now, here's a picture. As you can see here, the anterior shoulder of the baby is caught behind the pubic symphysis. Now the big issue here is that you get the cord trapped and occluded, which can lead to rapid hypoxia and acidosis, but there is associated birth trauma and complications to the baby that are less important than death that we can talk about during a uh, shoulder dystocia presentation. Now in terms of a simplified approach to treat shoulder dystocia, I'm going to explain just a four step approach. Step one, call for help and organize the equipment expecting a neonatal resuscitation. Step two is lie the woman flat and bring her legs up, her knees to nipples. What this does is it flattens the lumbar lordosis and gives the baby more room to be delivered. Third is place suprapubic pressure. Now this is initially done in just a constant fashion, trying to push through the abdomen so this anterior shoulder can slip under the pubic symphysis. And after that it's done in a, in a CPR or rocking-like motion if the initial attempts are unsuccessful. And lastly, roll the woman on all fours. Uh, and then just re-attempt to deliver the anterior or posterior shoulder first. Um, I'm often asked, how do you get a heavily pregnant woman who has almost entirely delivered a baby after a long labor to roll on all fours? The truth is, if you're just clear to them and say, I need you to roll onto all fours, I need to get your baby out right now, um, they just flip over. Now... I'm going to show you the helper mnemonic for shoulder dystocia. Now, we're not going to go into these in too much detail. Um, I'm just putting them there for reference. They're an excellent tool, and I would absolutely advocate for this to be your approach to shoulder dystocia if you regularly work in obstetrics. And the additional things here are include rotational maneuvers and removing the posterior arm. Um, but the truth is, for the average emergency clinician, um, the four-step approach will be effective more than two-thirds to three-quarters of the time and is much easier to remember than some of the internal manoeuvres and the technique uh, required to remove the posterior arm. So we're going to be simple. We're going to call for help. We're going to lie the woman flat with her legs up, knees to nipples. We're going to apply suprapubic pressure. And if that doesn't work, we're going to roll her on all fours. Now it's important to note that while you're doing the legs up or the suprapubic pressure, the mum should be trying to push the baby out whether or not she has a contraction. So the next topic is vaginal breech birth. And we'll just go through a bit of background here. And that is that, you know, it's uncommonly done now in an elective sense. It's usually only reserved for second twins. And Back in 2000, the term breach trial was published, and it essentially uh, was a looked at fetal outcomes following either elective cesarean or vaginal breech birth, and found worsened neonatal outcomes in the vaginal delivery group. Now, there were some methodological issues with this study, which do question the validity. However, the th uh, since 2000, this has been um, mostly abandoned in developed countries, which is now caused a lack of experience in vaginal breech birth to further worsen the gap between the two birth options. There are specialised breech services in larger centres, which is a great thing, um, which are focusing on appropriate patient selection, 
Um, but the reality is this is uncommonly done. The main risk with vaginal breech birth is an entrapped head. And what I mean by that is a normal head first or cephalic delivery the cervix needs to dilate up fully to 10 centimeters to allow the head, which is the largest diameter, to pass through the cervix. In a breech presentation, the cervix doesn't need to be fully dilated for the, for the bottom or the legs to pass through and the rest of the body. And then if you get to the point where the head can't be delivered because it's stuck behind an incompletely dilated cervix, this is what's called an entrapped head. Now, how I was taught to deliver a vaginal breach was essentially to sit on my hands in the corner of the room, let mum do it herself, and maybe stand her up. Um, in these cases, the babies are, much, are very likely to deliver. Um, the important thing to remember is that once you lay your hands on the child, um, they usually have an extensile response, which then you know, um, stops their ability to descend and deliver normally. If the, if the baby is not delivering, we then term a breech extraction, the manoeuvres you do to deliver the child. We're not going to go through those manoeuvres, but I've got a picture here for your reference, and we'll talk about it more in the breech presentation and breech vaginal birth discussion. Um, but it's important to, to know that in most major centres, you should have um, some obstetric help um, within five or ten minutes of calling for a vaginal breech birth. Now the other thing is just to expect the baby to require resuscitation. Breech um, births have a high rate of requiring neonatal resuscitation. So we're going to talk briefly about delivery of the placenta and cutting the cord. So this isn't going to be a discussion about active versus physiological third stage or delayed versus immediate cord clamping. But if you're in the emergency department, I think it's reasonable to cut the cord early and fairly long. If you use about 10 centimeters, I think that's a good rule of thumb because it'll give you plenty of length to insert an umbilical venous catheter and maybe have a second attempt if you're struggling um, in a baby if it uh, unexpectedly requires resuscitation. However, if mum and baby are doing well, there's no rush. Here's a little schematic of what I mean. So usually put two clamps on the cord and cut between them. Now there's no rush to deliver the placenta unless there's bleeding and in a normal third stage of labour it takes anywhere between 5 and 30 minutes. Now if like most emergency practitioners you are impatient, first of all I would say be very careful, but if you are going to deliver the placenta, make sure you uh, use controlled cord traction, which includes protecting the fundus from uterine inversion and awaiting the signs of separation, which are a rush of blood as the, as the placenta separates, the lengthening of the cord as the placenta drops down in the, in, towards the cervix, and the rising of the fundus. And that last one can be a bit hard to pick up if you're not used to uh, delivering placentas. Now some pictures here, you can see the left hand guarding the fundus, you can see the right hand across a set of sponge forceps just pulling slowly the cord down in the direction of the birth canal which is quite posterior. The next picture here shows um, the clinician holding the placenta between two hands and then actually um, rotating the placenta on itself to essentially try and braid the membranes following it to increase their strength and improves the delivery of the membrane so they're less likely to remain in the uterus. So we just mentioned uterine inversion as a complication of delivering the placenta and we'll talk about that briefly. So it's usually an iatrogenic emergency and the clues that you might have to it occurring is that you have severe pain maybe a visible uterus but not always and then shock. Now this is severely painful and requires immediate intervention so in the emergency department some strong IV analgesia such as fentanyl and if you are unable to perform the procedures required you may need to use dissociative anesthesia for this but this is not well described it's just what I feel my approach would be if I had a woman with shock uterine inversion who I was 
unable to replace the fundus on due to her extreme agitation. The management is to replace the fundus, then perform bimanual compression. And I have got a couple of video, a couple of pictures here. Just demonstrating the general technique. You may need a tocolytic to help replace the fundus and that might be tibutylene 250 micrograms subcut or GTN 50 micrograms intravenously and there's even been cases where getting four liters of fluid on four separate giving sets and placing the giving sets inside the vagina to hydrodilate um, the vaginal vault and therefore open up the cervix to facilitate reduction of the uterine inversion has been described as being quite a successful maneuver. It's important you don't remove the placenta. This will be done in the operating theatre as you can get severe hemorrhage. We'll talk about postpartum hemorrhage now. Now this is defined as more than 500 mils after a vaginal birth. It's important because it can be really frightening and it still kills women all over the world, particularly in developing countries. It's important to have an understanding of the causes and there's a mnemonic that stand, is the four T's. And that means tone for uterine atony, trauma for genital tract trauma, anywhere from the cervix to the perineal skin, tissue, which refers to retained placenta, and thrombin, which is essentially just a memory tool to remember coagulopathy. Um, uterine atony is the most common cause of postpartum hemorrhage. And this occurs because the placental bed um, is exposed once the placenta separates. And if the uterus doesn't contract appropriately, the spiral arteries that provide blood to the placenta just freely hemorrhage into the uterine cavity. And at term, uterine blood flow can be as high as 800 mils per minute. So it's easy to see how this could lead to rapid exsanguination. So once you've thought about the four T's, the management includes checking for which might be the cause, rubbing the fundus, which can, inst which can cause a contraction and call for help. Get access and resuscitate the patient. They might need a massive transfusion protocol. Um, and TXA has an increasing role in postpartum hemorrhage following the woman trial. Give some drugs to improve uterine tone, and we'll touch on those in a minute and perform bimanual compression and do this early. I've got a picture of bimanual compression here. Now it's best described as putting a, a making a fist in the anterior fornix that you can see here and then with your other hand providing suprapubic pressure. Bimanual compression was once taught to me by inserting the hand into the vagina like you're putting it into a Pringles jar just to make it pass easier and be less uncomfortable and only form the fist once in the anterior fornix. In terms of drugs for PPH, ergometrin is an alpha agonist and its dose is 250 micrograms IV or 500 micrograms IM. Sintocinon, which is given as a 5 unit IV bolus or a 10 unit IM bolus, which both can be repeated. Or an in, and then often following this, an infusion. Misoprostol, the prostaglandin analogs, given at a dose of 1,000 micrograms PR, but can be given buccally as well, which actually has a faster onset. And also prostaglandin F2 alpha. Now, anyone who's done obstetrics will remember this drug as, as give, is diluted up and given intramyometrially. And I've certainly done this at cesarean section. It, it produces quite uh, effective uh, uterine contraction. But fortunately now it is available in an IM formulation, which just allows the uh, effective administration in women who don't have their, their uterus on view. The next topic we want to talk about is preeclampsia. And I think it's an important topic to, um, to discuss as it can present to the ED in many different ways. Um, first of all, what is preeclampsia? Well, it's actually a disorder of placentation but the, path the pathogenesis itself is reasonably poorly understood. Um, it usually occurs over, four, over 20 weeks, but there are some instances such as molar pregnancy where it's been described earlier. And the diagnosis is essentially best thought of as high blood pressure 
and any evidence of end organ dysfunction. Now, more formally, that is a BP of over 140 or over 90 on more than one occasion, and any of kidney involvement, most commonly proteinuria, suggested by a protein crash creatinine ratio greater than 30, or oliguria or elevated creatinine can also be a manifestation of preeclampsia. Neurological manifestations, including headaches, visual changes, hyperreflexia and clonus, and seizures are obviously important, but these suggest eclampsia as a complication of preeclampsia. There can be hepatic dysfunction, which is a clinical spectrum from transaminitis to subcapsular hematoma and even rupture. Hematological, and this might include hemolysis and low platelets. Now there's also a clinical phenotype of severe preeclampsia, which is HELP syndrome, and that stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes and low platelets. There can be cardiovascular manifestations such as pulmonary edema, which forms a leading cause of death in developed countries for preeclampsia, and fetal um, manifestations of preeclampsia include intrauterine growth restriction. Now we'll talk briefly about the management principles, firstly of preeclampsia. The cure is delivery. Now I've popped a little asterisk there because a small number of cases actually occur postpartum where obviously delivery isn't an option. And it's a balance between maternal condition and prematurity. So the decision to deliver is very easy at 39 weeks because the baby has no, has no more to gain by being in, in, in utero. But at 24 weeks, this is obviously a much more difficult decision. So it really depends on how unwell mum is versus how premature baby is. Now BP lowering is important and it should be considered over 160 on 100 but definitely over 170 on 110. And the easy way to remember your BP target is that you're aiming for the same blood pressure that defines preeclampsia. The reason we're not shooting for normal is that um, this can, as normal blood pressure might actually lead to reduced perfusion of the baby. Magnesium sulfate forms the mainstay of seizure prophylaxis if you have severe preeclampsia. And the dosing I'll go through in a moment, but just interestingly, it's important to note that the number needed to treat for magnesium is 90 for seizure prevention, and the number needed to harm is 200 for respiratory depression. Now, magnesium toxicity manifests as respiratory depression, hyporeflexia, and um, and the treatment is similar to hyperkalemia in that you'd give a bolus of 10 mils of 10% calcium gluconate and then repeat if necessary. Now, eclampsia, as I said, we, this is defined as preeclampsia plus seizures. The cure, again, is delivery. It's important to understand the seizures are usually generalized, self-terminating, tonic-clonic seizures. And if they're prolonged or focal, then you need to think about other causes like underlying epilepsy, uh, metabolic disturbance, intracerebral hemorrhage, secondary to hypertension. Um, if the seizure description or what you see isn't typical for eclampsia. The mainstay of management is magnesium sulfate. And this is usually given as a 4 gram loading dose over 30 minutes, which is close to 20 millimoles, then a 1 gram per hour infusion, which is around 5 millimoles per hour, and then an additional 2 grams or 10, roughly 10 millimoles over 5 minutes for recurrent seizures. Now, this is more magnesium than most emergency physicians are used to using, but it's quite safe and magnesium toxicity is very rare, especially in those without renal dysfunction. Um, in, for example, in the, in the United States, they actually use a 6 gram loading dose and 1 to 2 grams per hour. So this dosing is relatively, um, relatively lower. I think eclampsia management or seizures in eclampsia is best thought of as magnesium than follow a status algorithm. Just remembering, as I said earlier, if the seizures are prolonged, I'd have a low threshold for neuroimaging. 
think of other causes if prolonged or focal or resistant to treatment is the point I've just made. Now lastly we're going to talk about maternal advanced life support and resuscitative hysterotomy and I thought we'd just review the adaptations to advanced life support in pregnancy. Now importantly this includes manual uterine displacement which is placing a hand on the right hand side of the uterus and pulling it over to the left and that's been decided to be better than better than uh, left lateral tilt and is more likely to facilitate easy clinical interventions. Establish ALS resuscitation and perform resuscitative hysterotomy with consensus guidelines that it's indicated after 20 weeks. Other than this there's no difference. ALS drugs, defibrillation, position of compressions are all the same to the non-pregnant patient. In terms of the resuscitative hysterotomy the old mantra and the recommendation is that you start by four minutes and deliver the baby by five minutes. Now, this is easy to remember, which is which is very useful, but logistically difficult. And having read all published case reports, I'm not aware of any where the babies were delivered by five minutes post cardiac arrest. Now, the available data we have actually suggests that there's a more linear relationship between survival and time of delivery post arrest which makes sense but there's no big outcome change beyond five minutes and interestingly the 50 percent injury free threshold was 25 minutes for both mum and baby suggesting that a resuscitative hysterotomy done at 25 minutes might result in half of the babies having no neurological injury I've always thought it's useful to know how far into a resuscitation it might be helpful and really all we can do there is is look to case literature to see how far into a cardiac arrest have there been maternal and newborn survival and those numbers are 37 minutes for maternal survival 57 minutes for newborn survival and at 45 and 30 minutes there's been newborns um, born without neurological injury followed up to six months and four years with those two figures there. So I guess the take-home point is quite deep into a resuscitation it could still be a useful adjunct. Just in terms of the resuscitative hysterotomy I want to briefly talk about surgical technique and if anything make it more simple and I think the first way to make it more simple is to reconsider the anatomy. If we have a look here at the pregnant abdomen via coronal section, we can see that skin, fascia, muscle, peritoneum, and then uterus. Now during pregnancy, especially in the absence of prior surgery, but in most women, the abdominal organs are displaced superiorly and posteriorly, meaning that an anterior approach to the abdomen there's very little other organs in the way the bladder here can ride up a little bit but is of no importance and bladder and bowel injury really should just be disregarded um, during rapid entry into the abdomen so the revised surgical steps for a resuscitative hysterotomy continue with advanced life support and manual uterine displacement until knife to skin get a big scalpel and make a big cut vertical midline from the top of the uterus to just above the pubic symphysis. Cut down to the uterus and then cut through the uterus and down to either the baby or the amniotic fluid and then extend this with scissors ideally or trauma shears with a hand guarding the baby from being lacerated. Now you can use the scalpel here too that's fine you just need to be careful you can actually extend the uterine incision manually with your fingers but the upper segment of the uterus is, is actually quite thick as opposed to the, the lower segment where you would start your incision. Then pull the baby out, often with some assistance from an assistant, and then cut and clamp the cord long. Pull out the placenta, pack and clamp anything that's bleeding, and go back to work on mum. In terms of the minimum equipment required, you need a big scalpel, maybe two of them, as the, often the emergency department cheap scalpels blunt quickly, 
some scissors or trauma shears and an extra set of hands rather than the retractors. Ideally, also have suction and big swabs and clamps and large like one or ovicrol available just for hemostasis if you get return of spontaneous circulation. I make a point here that this is an emergency medicine procedure and that is we need to take ownership of the resuscitative hysterotomy as a resuscitative adjunct. It's not to say that if an experienced obstetrician is in the room that you wouldn't have them assist you, but it's important that we take ownership of these critical interventions, learn how to do them, when to do them, and get as much simulated practice that we can. Now, in terms of take-home points, sometimes we forget that women have been delivering babies for a while now, and so when these women come into the ED, the odds are that it will be fine. Remember with a breech, sit on your hands and use gravity. Remember so with shoulder dystocia, lie the woman flat, knees to nipples, super pubic pressure, then all fours. A postpartum hemorrhage is more than 500 mils. Treat early and hard in the ED. Remember the four causes, tone, trauma, tissue, thrombin. And in terms of management, rub the fundus, call for help, resuscitate the woman, find the cause, give drugs, and buy manual compression early. There's no rush to deliver the placenta. If you, pull, if you do rush and you pull too hard too early, you can get a uterine inversion. If that happens, put it back and do bimanual compression. Remember, preeclampsia is blood pressure more than 140 on 90 and just about anything else in terms of end organ dysfunction. Eclampsia management is magnesium sulfate, and if the seizures are prolonged, follow a status epilepticus algorithm and arrange delivery. In terms of perimortem caesarean section, or what's more recently being referred to as resuscitative hysterotomy, start ALS, then cut hard and do it early, and remember this is our procedure to learn and to try and master. So thanks very much for listening. Uh, my name is Ben Shepherd from Obcast. Thanks to those at Developing EM for giving me the opportunity to speak, and I hope this has been useful.